I can't remember what I told you I was going to be talking about, but I thought I made up a PowerPoint here of using the natural miticides as opposed to the synthetic miticides. And in our operation, um, when Vero first hit back in the 1990s, early 1990s, um, I thought, because I had already bred bees that were resistant to, completely immune to American fowl brood. I bred for gentleness, I bred for color, I bred for uh, tracheal mite resistance. I thought, oh, another mite, no big deal. Well, I was dead wrong on, on that. So my really good, strong bees just got eaten alive by Varroa. And I almost gave up beekeeping. We had about 250 colonies at that time. And I just walked away and heartbroken with most of all of them dead. And then somebody said, hey, these little plastic strips work like magic. So we got the flu valinate strips and, and put them in and sure enough, it was really easy keeping bees for about six years. And then the flu valve, they started to fail. And they said, okay, well, here now we got this new one, these Kumafos strips. And I go, Kumafos, that's the, um, a, 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 a organophosphate. I said, I thought they were phasing those out. And you open up the package and they go, oh my God, that is, this is not why I got into beekeeping to smell this kind of stuff. And I had it for one year and I said, okay, I'm getting off this because they're going to, uh, it's going to go bad. And, and in three years, Kumafos no longer works. So I said, I'm going to get off the pesticide treadmill. And we haven't used the synthetic miticide since the year 20, uh, 2001. So um, uh, we've been um, using nothing but the organic, um, uh, not necessarily certified organic, but the organic treatments. So uh, uh, thymol, um, oxalic acid, and formic acid. So uh, I can tell you right now, We've run a commercial operation now for over 20 years doing that. So it's, it's totally possible to do. So they're called biopesticides. So when you look at the, um, the let's see, you guys can't tell you what. Okay, I'll use the mouse so they can see my, my pointer too. Okay, integrated pest management pyramid for, for anything. But this is for Varroa. You start first start with cultural or biological stock. Well, that's easy to say, but we really don't have the, we're working on that. Unless you want to keep Africanized honeybees, they're, they're more resistant, um, but they have other traits that aren't so much fun. <laughs> then there's physical, mechanical, biotechnical. So that's like um, using powder sure dusting. Screen bottom boards just really don't do much. And the problem with screen bottom boards, it also cools off the temperature of the brood nest slightly. And when you cool the temperature of the brood nest, that makes it more favorable to varroa reproduction. Varroa mites like a cooler brood nest. So you, you, you actually can hurt yourself with the screen bottom board. Um, and um, uh, uh, induced brood breaks, those are all physical, mechanical, or biotechnical uh, methods. And then monitoring of the mite level. And we're really, really big on, on that. And I just made a breakthrough on my mite wash cups um, so tomorrow, anybody's coming to the workshop tomorrow, we'll, we'll make, make a bunch of them. I'll show you how to, a really easier way to make them. And then you, you move up to biopesticides. Um, and the last resort, you synthetic pesticides. Unfortunately, in most countries of the world, the beekeeper skipped all these steps and went straight to uh, synthetic pesticides, except for South Africa. South Africa didn't, didn't do that. And then after you go to, if you read the, the South African Beekeeping Journal or you look at their, their summary of their uh, annual meetings, they don't even mention Varroa. Can you imagine a beekeeper's meeting where you never even mention Varroa? They all have it, but it's not a, not a problem for them because they, they didn't jump to the synthetic chemicals, let nature take its course, and they all have Varroa resistant bees. Yeah. It's Apis mellifera uh, scutellata, the uh, savannah honeybee. They're fairly hot. Yeah. So, and so one of the things in my selective breeding program, the other queen producers who come out to visit, they're always very skeptical and say, oh, well, if they're mite resistant, they're going to be hot and they're not going to be honey producers. I said, I'm not going to say anything. Why don't you come out and do some mite washes with me? And we'll go out and we'll mite wash a bunch of breeders. And, 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 I'll, and then when we're done, I'll say, so what do you think? And they said, well, I was sure wrong. <laughs> they're the gentlest gentlest bees you've ever seen and, or can be the gentlest bees you've ever seen and often the best honey producer in the yard and completely immune to a varroa and they're very healthy they're better producers because they don't have any mites or viruses when i have sent paired samples in for pcr for viruses the ones that are naturally resistant sitting next to a hive that is 
low mite levels due to treatment, the virus levels are way lower in the naturally resistant ones. So, so by simply by having controlling the mite all the time, they are able to um, just be healthier in the colonies, you know, all, all year long. Anyway, so biopesticides, that's what I want to move on to here. Come on. Why is this not working? Okay, hang on. Yeah, but I used a different, my changer's not working for some reason. Oh man, okay. So, um, no, I got the on off switch on. I got the batteries, but the way I can tell is that the laser, the laser pointer works, I should be, huh, darn. Okay, I will use the button. Um, so these are the ones we're looking at here, the, um, the, the formic acid, the thymol and the oxalic acid. Okay, so this is on my first year beekeeping webpage, and I can go over it, but this is, just lays out which treatments at which time of the season, by time of season, have nothing to do with date, having to do with colony condition, okay, buildup, because your season here is way different than most of the other seasons throughout the world. Use my bro my model, I made a special uh, tab just for your seasons here. So, um, and typically most areas it's gonna take, in California, it typically is gonna take about four major mite reductions a year to keep your colonies healthy, depending on how resistant your stock is. But different times, depending whether there's honey flow on, where there's a lot of brood, where there's not much brood, um, where there's pollen coming in, um, different ones work better. So you can look at this tape, at this on that first year beekeeping and figure out which ones to use at which time of the season to plan your Varroa strategy. So let's go through these here. I'm gonna go through the essential oils and organic acids very quickly. And, and then we're gonna focus mainly on uh, oxalic acid. So thymol, there's a number of treatments out there on the uh, market, thymol virus up in Canada, not in the United States. And um, it can work quite well. If all the essential oils, first thing, Humans love essential oils. We like the smell of them. The reason plants make essential oils is to repel or poison insects. Honeybees generally hate most essential oils. They like lemongrass oil at a very low level, but they pretty much hate all essential oils, okay? You're not doing your bees any favor by putting essential oils in, in there. With thymol, of all the ones tested, it's the, the most proven. Although I got a list of other ones that have been tested around the world that look promising. And they're on my to-do list for this for this year, um, but time works uh, quite well. Bees don't like it, but mites like it even less. It, it'll put some mites back. So we've used this Apigar gel for a long time. Now, time does not dissolve into water hardly at all. So it's not a dissolved in this gel. It's ground up particles of time in an aqueous gel with the sodium poly polymethacrylate um, um, uh, gel beads in there. We find that it works really well on in an inch and a half rim placed on top of a double deep uh, um, colony in hot weather. We put it in 95 degree weather um, regularly. It takes two treatments. And the thing is the bees have to physically remove the gel. If they don't physically remove it, it doesn't count. It doesn't vaporize enough without re removal. Okay, and then the Apilophora has other essential oils also in a uh, cellulose matrix. And the bees really roar, really don't like the oils in this one, but they say it makes it more efficacious. So some beekeepers also make their own pads um, with vegetable oil and dissolving thyme oil. That's not legal, okay? Uh, I'm not gonna promote any off-label or illegal treatments at all, but I'm gonna just, I just this is just reality. And the bees don't like the smell of thyme oil. If it's not too intense, they will cover it up with propolis and just glue it down like this and just block off the, the, the smell. If it's too intense, they will build a wall around it. And it looks like a flower cup around here where they're trying to keep those, the vapors back around, around them. So the question I had is whether we could develop an improved delivery method. So first I looked at what's the dose per hive. So the Apigard is 12 and a half grams. Uh, per, per dose. And then I looked at the other ones, the other Apigard, Apilophar, and Tamavar. So 12 and a half grams, eight grams, and 15 grams. So that 12 grams is right in the middle. And all of these re require anywhere from two to four treatments. You have to keep repeating the treatments, which is a pain in the butt. 
So I tried just putting time all straight with no oil at all on uh, shop towels and found out you put 12 grams in on a shop towel, you're gonna blow all the bees right out of the hive. You put six grams in in a shop towel, there's, they may beard up for a day, but um, um, it doesn't blow them out of the hive, but it's not that efficacious. You have to keep repeating that six gram uh, dose. And unlike the other ones, where, like, it, where it takes a long time to evaporate, um, the, um, um, on a shop towel, the bees fan it heavily and get the fumes down very, very quickly. And within a couple of days, they start chewing on it and disappear the towel out of the hive very, very quickly. So if they can blow air over it, fan it in the middle of the brood nest, they will evaporate it very quickly. So I was wondering just how this works when you put it in the gel up on top of the hive. So I use fluorescent pigment and put it in the gel up um, above the brood chamber. And then I also put it um, on a uh, blue towel and then um, put a sticky board underneath, let the bees remove both of them to see whether they just carry it out the entrance or where it goes. Well, it goes straight down between the brood frames. So you can see this is the, with the polyacrylate gel here, and this is the paper towel right here. So apparently what this, they're doing is the way that it works is they, as they're taking these little pieces, particles down between the brood frames, it's evaporating right there in the warm brood frames and you're getting enough vaporization there. So that's why I found it's, it, the, the physical removal is critical. You can't, it's not just the vapor action. So then we did a bunch of experimentation. These are uh, 16 different ratios of thyme oil and vegetable oil on uh, this is homosote, uh, fiber board, insulation board, cellulose insulation board. And to see what worked best in the hive and how the bees responded to them, which ones they would propolize, which ones they would chew up. <laughs> and um, we found out that some, if, they, if there's very little oil, they just chew it away. If there's a bunch of oil, they just cover it with propolis. So I said, well, I'm <laughs> gonna give up on oil. So we don't, stopped using oil. And I did this back in 2017, and it's been on my to-do list. I was talking to you guys about my to-do list <laughs> since then. So I decided to uh, get back to this again, to this um, homos homosote board. So um, we tested out just dissolving it, um, thymol and alcohol, denatured alcohol, make a saturated solution, soaking up in the homosote uh, board strips. And it's very easy to calculate how many grams to put in there. So I said, well, I'll do 12 grams in a colony, so three grams by four strips. And I put them in either between the brood chambers or on top in a rim in a number of colonies. And then we went back and looked inside and watched how the bees responded to it because it didn't blow them out of the hive at all. Normally the bees will move the brood nest away from the thyme all. A number of the pupae will, will die. And I go, well, the, yeah, 12 grams doesn't even seem to bother them. They don't seem to notice it at all. I go, well, maybe I should be brave. And uh, so very little uh, brood disruption. Let me see if this is working yet. You dang thing, what is the matter with you? Oh man, okay, so I'm not gonna do it. Um, very little brood disruption. So instead of just shutting down brood, rearing, move it away, they just kept rearing, rearing brood. So I tried 24 grams, which if you put on other matrix, would blow the hive right on the out of the box. <laughs> they did fine with 24 grams. I couldn't believe it. So, I, I, um, and what they do is here they are where they're chewing the, you can see them chewing the blocks away. After a, oh, a couple of weeks, they would start to remove it. So eventually there would be no trace left, which is really nice when you don't have to come back and remove something. And there they are where they've chewed it away. So we tried 48 grams, 95 degree weather outside. 48 grams between the brood chambers, a little bit rough on them, but up on the rim on top, hardly rough at all. This is um, at, after 21 days in hot weather, look at that brood. I mean, they tolerate it very, very well. And my counts are zero. So that, after that, I said, well, let's go back to the 36 grams. I did some for those, so I'd have 12 gram increments. Um, this is after 74 days um, out in that hot weather, colony just booming, doing just, just fine. So I could do a dose response curve where the, this is the number of grams of thymol per hive, 12, 24, 36, 48. 
small number, six, six colonies, seven colonies, and three colonies here. And this is your percent reduction in the mite count. You can see at the, at the 12 gram dose, you had a wide variation, it's not very efficacious. Pretty good at 24 grams, 100%, all three, zero mites. So probably the sweet spot's probably somewhere between that 36 and 48 grams. So I'll be doing more extensive testing with this this year, yeah. Yeah, we, we, have, we did like uh, every other. No, what we did, we just kept op opening up the colonies. So hang on a second, maybe you missed a slide. That's after 74 days, after 48 grams in hot weather. You tell me, does that colony look healthy? Yes, <laughs> full of honey, full of brood. You look back and that's, that's after 21 days in hot weather with 48 grams. You tell me. There's your colony assessment. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We we go back and forth in snow and hot weather. Okay. So um the organic acids. So let's hops beta acids. So, Tastes like Guinness stout on steroids, really bitter. Hop guard three works very well. One treatment in a broodless colony. You guys don't have much option for broodless colonies here, I know that. It will work in, um, uh, the, the, the bees do move the brood away from it briefly for about two weeks, then they'll go right back out, back underneath it. Real, the hop guard three is better than the hop guard one or hop guard two, less bothers the bees less. And, um, but it requires, if there's brood in the colonies, it requires repeated treatments, two to three repeated treatments, uh, a week to two weeks apart to get very good efficacy. And then formic acid, these are carpenter ants up in, in, in my area. And if you pick them up you, and try breathing in, your lungs just stop because of the formic acid smell and your eyes will start to water. Bees have dealt with formic acid forever. So they're very used to it. It's the only treatment that actually penetrates the cappings and can kill mites under sealed uh, brood cappings. We'll get to that. It also tends to give colonies a fresh start. You can have a colony that allows your brood pattern and give them a formic treatment and the brood always comes back just beautiful. I don't know why that is, but it's something we see. So the downside, it may cause colonies to supersede their queens, typically older queens or poorly performing queens. One way to remove all your lousy queens is to hit them with formic acid and then they'll, they'll replace all the, uh, the lousy ones. On the other hand, with our second year queens. So, so we save some of our se second year queens and let them start again to, because um, uh, they get a, a jump on, over first year queens. And then we, uh, later in the season, we want to replace them and we hit the colonies really hard with formic acid <laughs> and it doesn't, does not kill them all. Second year queens, when you <laughs> want to kill them in hot weather, you may not be able to. So it's a, uh, all right, so one of the options is just cage the queen, put her aside. It's just the, the first day of hard flash that tends to cause the bees to um, replace the queen um, and then put her back in after a few days or put her in a little nuke to the side. Uh, you can do the Formic Pro uh, one strip repeated at 10 days. You'll have fewer queen issues or you can do two, two strips at once or if you're really serious, put three strips on. I can, that's not legal, legal, label approved, but you get much you get better efficacy. So it depends on how you want to use it. We, we often use very large doses. Uh, we, we're recording this. Okay, never mind. There are beekeepers that I know that buy formic acid by the 55 gallon drum. Use a lot of formic acid, okay? And, and if you want to just immediately remove all the mites from a colony, formic acid is the only treatment that was just overnight, I mean, literally overnight before the next morning we kill almost all the mites in, in the whole colony. <clears throat> then you, you, for that, um, this is unapproved to use a flashboard above. You put it on the flashboard and, and uh, put it on a desk and by morning, the mites are, are gone. But at, if you wanna get all the mites gone, the queen will generally be gone too. At a lower dose, you'll get good mite control and you'll still have a queen. So there are, I'm gonna skip to you all this. Now back to, can you reduce the queen kill with it. So one of the things I did is, is by, to measure the daily weight loss of it. 
Okay, so this is your, your grams of weight loss per day. So this on the first day, this is 30 grams of weight loss. So that tells you how strong, how much is going out evaporating each day uh, in, in a colony. These, this is done, these are done in a double deep of drawn comb in, in 95 degree weather, but no honeybees. So no, no bee effect of fanning, okay? And then go back every day and I measure it. And what I wondered is if I simply cover the top side with the wrapper um, of the uh, of the strip, can I reduce that first day flash? The optimal range is somewhere in this green area. That's what you'd ideally want for mite control, sustain. And, and the product before the the the, the Mitoway Quick Strip was the Mitoway Two Pad, which was up in this range for like seven days. We actually like that better than the new than the newer uh, iterations. Um, so, but look at the difference here. If you cover the cover the top side, you don't get that first day major flash there. That's what takes the queens out. And then later on, you're actually getting more release per day in the covered strip than in the uncovered strip. So that made me uh, uh, curious. And what I found is in our nukes, we often want to treat nukes with with young queens in very hot weather in dark wooden boxes. And what we found is you take a, a strip and just cut it in half crossways, put it across the top bars, put the lid down and stand on it and seal the top surface. Now you've eliminated almost all the evaporation area because the, the top bars underneath cover most of the bottom. So you're only evaporating around the edge and, um, and the little strips between the top bars. And that works beautiful. You don't lose any queens. Hot weather works really cool. So, and actually I should have shown this one first because we, we, we figured this one out first. And don't know. Unfortunately, it's hard for us to dial the thermostat down during the summer. So, so I can't really tell you. Um, here's, here's a couple of my assistants here. Rose uh, with the squint uh, had never smelled formic acid before. And we are demonstrating that if you put the strips into it between the double deep, after a week, you can hardly smell any formic acid at all. You put the lid down over it or put the cover over it after a week. <laughs> there's Rose telling you right there. It, it, uh, so in a nuke colony in 95 degree weather with that lid down tight, 10 days later, those strips are still soft and they still have plenty of formic. So it really extends the release rate. So we tried a bunch of experiments putting um, the foil over the top of them and putting them into the hives. So what I'm showing you here is, so this is uh, in one yard, um, all, all the colonies uh, receive cover strips. Each one of these pairs of columns is a colony. The blue columns, you're starting mite count, mites per hundred bees. So this, this had 100, uh, over 110 mites in a mite wash count, very, very high. And uh, the end, red column is after um, 21 uh, days, um, what, what you had for mite count. And ideally, we want to see all blue and no red. Um, so, um, and we found this in, in previous years. During the summer, the uh, you get maybe a 50% mite reduction. You're not going to get a 90 um, uh, during the summer. Um, but the big thing was zero queen loss. Now, in the same yard, the year before, the same temperature when we did this without the covering, we had a very large percentage of queen turnover. So that was pretty exciting. So we did it to it in another yard here, and we um, covered half, in only half the hives, we covered the strips. The other half of the hives, we did not cover the strips. So these are the uncovered strips. These are the covered strips. And, and what we wanted to look for was efficacy to see if there was a difference in mite reduction. And if you see, see here, there wasn't much difference. So it doesn't look like, it wasn't great mite reduction, but it didn't seem to make any difference whether they were uncovered or covered. And out of all these um, hives, we only had one queen turnover. So um, if back to your observation about queen loss, this is one way to avoid queen loss when you're using the mite away uh, uh, pads. Yeah. Nope, I didn't, but we did something similar. So it occurred to us, well, why don't we just leave the strips in the wrapper, both strips in the wrapper, cut the ends off and then cut it in half again right here. Now, all you're gonna have is the ends exposed. So that would be similar to putting on top. You have a very low dosage long-term. So we put in the, the full two-strip dose 
but just with the ends cut off. And then he, to make it tough, I put an entrance reducer on uh, to seal the hive off with only a 3 8 inch by 3 inch wide entrance, okay? Which normally would just, um, the bees would just beard out like crazy. This was the maximum bearding we saw in hot weather, and it only lasted for one day. After a day, we saw no more bearding at all. And then I got my high tech uh, instrument for assessing the amount of forming vapor coming out of the uh, out of the entrances, and I got down and I sniffed them all in the morning. Normally, it would choke me up immediately if you if you have the, the strips in there. I couldn't even smell it, so it was a very slow release on there, and uh, the results were it's really easy on the bees. It doesn't bother them at all but it's also really easy on the mites and didn't, didn't bother them at all. So yeah, that, <laughs> that, that long-term, very slow release uh, made me know. So, okay, you're Californian. Uh, other states have to explain why Californians are so weird is because we all suck on buttercup oxalis when we're growing up and it causes permanent brain damage. Um, anyway, uh, what you're sucking on is a mixture as a solution of sugar and, and oxalic acid. The plant's name is oxalis. Oxalic acid is named for the oxalis plant. And we, most of all of us suck on it when we're, when we're growing up. And the common way of putting it on is with the uh, dribble, dribble method, the five milliliters per bees. And if you just Google oxalic acid treatment table, this table will come up and show you how to mix, mix it all up. Um, you can put it on with a, a syringe. Um, you can put it on with a teaspoon, that's five milliliters, and pour, slowly pour it. Um, the other handy way is to get one of those ketchup uh, bottle squirters, the clear ones with the spout, and you can eyeball the five milliliters, and that's a very quick way for small scale. If you're going to do very many colonies, we use a, uh, a garden sprayer at very low pressure with only a, a small amount of the liquid in the sprayer and mostly air volume so that the pressure doesn't change as you're doing it. And then uh, um, you can take a graduated cylinder and calibrate it so that one second puts out five milliliters. And all you gotta do is walk up and just go, chimpanzee one, chimpanzee two, chimpanzee three, chimpanzee four. 10 seconds to do 10 frames of bees. Very quick, we get, a pair of us can do 400 hives in a day. And uh, there's my sons out there doing a, um, a winter cleanup. So we, every, we have a, in our area, we have a brood break typically late November up till at least Christmas time. So just before Christmas, we go ahead and give them all a dribble and then it starts our colonies clean, pretty clean going to spring. Then the summer, you have to create an induced brood break. Um, multiple dribbles are, are tough on the colony. Um, and in Italy, uh, a lot of them have these little cages. Um, the other thing you can do is we use, I make these excluder uh, divider boards up for our queen rearing. So we can isolate a queen on a day on a frame. And then four days later, we have all one day old larvae to graph. So we use these a lot. And, but you can just simply put it into the hive, put two of them in and trap a frame between them. And you can find the queen to this one frame uh, right here. You can find her for two weeks. Okay, so if you're gonna start on a Saturday, two weeks, Saturdays later, you can then you can pull the queen out but leave the frame in there for one more week. And then on the, um, on the third week, the third Saturday, um, there's no mites under the brood. Maybe a few in, if there's drone cells, but essentially no mite, all the mites are out pull that frame out, get, freeze it or do whatever you want, feed it the chickens and hit them with oxalic acid. And now you've essentially, and the queen's only stops, she can lay for another week because a mite can't enter a cell until day eight. So you can let her lay for another other week. And then just before they start capping the cells, hit them with oxalic acid and start with the clean colony. That's something you guys could do anywhere. And this, this chart is on my first year beekeeping uh, page. Then oxalic acid vaporization. How many of you have tried oxalic acid vaporization? Okay, so it's funny, state, state by state and country by country, some places it's really popular, some places nobody does it. Um, so uh, yeah, the dribble is not very efficacious if there's brood present. And we did a, a trial. What would happen if we did multiple dribbles at four day intervals and, and we did different kinds of dribbles. And what we found was for my control, so this is mites per half cup of bees. We almost no effect doing four treatments at four day intervals. But here, look at this here. This is uh, frames of bees, colony strength. Notice none of the ones dribbled increased in strength, but the control group, which did not increase in strength. 
that tells you there's an adverse effect from doing multiple dribbles. Now, I don't, I haven't seen good data on, on vaporization, but I, I, it, I don't see a major effect here. So this is now approved for use when Honey Super Saw to do vaporizations. The question is how well does it work? And I'm, I'll be publishing an article on this soon. I've got a bunch of data sets from beekeepers throughout the world who have done mite, count, mite counts on the sticky boards over and over and over again. And this is one of the fairly extreme ones. This guy did them uh, in the Seattle. Every red triangle is a vaporization, okay? Every four days for a very long period of time. Now, if it were efficacious, these black mite counts would start dropping off pretty quickly. This is fairly typical. It typically takes seven to 10 vaporizations at the rate of one gram per brood chamber, which is the legal dose to apply. Yeah. Ramesh, yeah? You should be talking to the microphone. Yeah. Uh, last year, we had a university professor, I believe from Oregon, who came to talk to us about the amount of oxalic acid to vaporize into a brood chamber. And he was doing trials, and I believe he's going to publish his data this year. But he was finding that the standard of one gram per deep was nowhere near enough. He was His data suggested that it was in between two and four grams, with two grams not being enough and four grams being enough, but he was seeing a little detriment to the colony. So he was going to test three grams per deep and publish that data this year. Um, with your tests, did you only do one gram per deep or did you go any higher? This may be the trial that he was referring to right here, this, this data. Okay, so but this wasn't by this wasn't by Ramesh. So Ramesh may be uh, duplicating this. This is by Cameron Jack uh, in Florida. And what he found was, yes, just said, okay, it takes two to four. That's not a, the approved dose. But on the label, and I'm not saying I made it break the label. It doesn't say what the reapplication interval is. And it doesn't limit the number how many doses you can put on. So some beekeepers are um, putting one gram in, another gram in, another gram in, okay? And that is more efficacious um, uh, to do that. So Argentina had a great idea. Why don't we do an extended release oxalic acid and dissolve it in glycerin? Still, this is not legal to use. I do get a pesticide research authorization every for all these experimentations. I'm, I cover my butt. So I, I, I apply every year and I get a research authorization for the thiamol and for the oxalic acid. And the two, two half Swedish sponges, about 60 square inches, 55, 60 square inches of surface area. And the, it's, the surface area is more important than the dose. I'll be working more on that uh, this year. You have to have enough surface area so that enough bees are walking over it to, to pick up the residues. But at the um, surface area of a Swedish sponge cut in half, two halves down, we get very good efficacy. Look how little, how little red there is right there. And this was only at 42 days. We found that if you go for 60 to 75 days, the efficacy keeps increasing, okay? The, the red disappears even more. And Here's the gentleman who wants to tell me about adverse effects on the brood. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> and this and this is what I get. I get. I get. E, I get my text. I get photographs from all over the world from beekeepers saying, "Randy, <laughs> thank you for <laughs> for this." And I I assume they all have pesticide research authorization, so I don't bother to ask. Um, but they're talking like these are the. This is like keeping bees before varroa. This massive honey crops, beautiful brood patterns. And uh, so I get a lot of these. Now, here's the interesting thing. I was working with some grad students. Um, in fact, the data just got published at, at these uh, high elevation wet meadows in the Sierra Nevada, 6,500 feet. No resident honeybees at all until I brought them in for these experiments. Look at the lack of red. <laughs> Look at the starting mite counts. These up here. 50 bites in a mite wash. Usually that's a colony is going to be toast after that. Okay. Okay. These are all high starting counts. Look at the ending counts. If you don't see red, the ending count is zero. Amazing. And then we had another group where we take them up to a pumpkin pollination in the desert in Nevada. Again, no resident honeybees. They came back even looking better than this. 
for the first time, they came back chock full of honey and zero mites across the board. I was, my, when, my, when my sons brought back the truck and unloaded them, I said, oh God, Eric, I'm gonna get out there and do some mite washes tomorrow. I'm really curious. And I'm taking all these samples and he's running the mite washer. And uh, after a while I said, Eric, I'm not hearing from you. What's happening? He goes, God, dad, I've never seen so many zeros <laughs> in a row. Just so makes me wonder about mite immigration. So I've done a number of studies on mite immigration. I got one being published right now in the series in the American Bee Journal. But here's a, a one of the graphs here where you, you use synthetic mites. Since my mites have never been exposed to synthetic miticides, if I want to eliminate mites from an experimental colony, I can put in a couple of synthetic miticides, boom, this, there's no more mites dropping at all. So these are your sticky board counts on these dates, September uh, through November, um, every uh, twice a week right here. So th these would be like about five mites coming in. Uh, this would be 15 mites sticky board. And the beauty is if you get a rain event and the mite count suddenly drops down at each rain event, that tells you those mites are not coming from inside that hive. They're coming day after day from outside the hive. So this mite immigration appears to counteract the efficacy of the extended release oxalic acid. So the Argentines used uh, these chipboard uh, strips. Um, and I first time I tried this years ago uh, and showed it to my son, I said, oh, Eric, God, these were great. He goes, well, how many strips in a hive, dad? Well, I found out it took four strips per brood chamber. And he goes, let's see, eight strips per hive, 1,500 hives. And he does, he's really good at math. He told me the number. He said, not going to happen, dad. <laughs> Figure out something else. So I said, well, how about the beekeepers stand by the blue shop towel, which all commercial beekeepers use for off-label treatments. And that works pretty well, except for big colony to colony variation. Some colonies chew them out right away. Some just propolize them over. So we tried other matrices and the Swedish sponges work very well. I'm testing out a few other matrices this year. I'm not done at all with uh, testing. We just lay two of them between the brood chambers like this, leaving enough space for a pollen sub patty in between there. And then I was curious, how much surface area you actually needed. So we cut them into four strips and put either one, two, three, or four in the colonies to see what total surface area you needed. And it, it, and it takes the, a total of one, whoops, one full sponge equivalent, about 55 square inches. Oddly, if you hang the strips between the frames, what would you think? Would it take more or less? You should think so. So one of the rules I've learned after years and years of bee research is you're gonna to be totally wrong with common sense at least half the time, at least half the time. And every bee researcher I've talked to confirms that. It takes almost twice as much, almost twice as much surface area when you're hanging into the frames as it does when you lay them on top. Totally contrary to what we humans think is common sense. I don't know why. Um, so I'm, I've tested all kinds of, of them. Um, another one that uh, works well are these right here. And yes, these do have a fire retardant. I'm not at liberty to disclose what it is, but it's not one I'd be concerned about. Okay. Um, yeah. No, that's not the conclusion. Because all of my zero, zero, zero mite colonies have neighbors with inbound mites, outbound mites. We're not talking about mite resistance. We're talking about for oxalic treatment. You said mite resistant colony. I'm not talking about mite resistant colonies. Mine immigration makes this application method of oxalic acid less efficacious. Okay, that good? And what I prefer is biodegradable the matrices. So these are some Swedish sponges throwing the compost pile. After a couple of weeks, they just get all chewed up. So I'm trying to avoid any kind of plastics. Maximizer pads work pretty well. They, they do have a little bit of plastic. I, so I'm, I, I got some more. I've got, oh. Uh, okay, and then I tried cherry cloth. 
these green Swedish sponges, the If You Care brand, um, which is easily available on Amazon, but they cost about a buck a piece. Um, the distributor for the US uh, emailed me recently and said, uh, how come I'm getting all these orders for If You Care pads? What do you know about it, Randy? I, I got your name. And I told him, he goes, well, let me see what we can do. So he just emailed me this morning. I said, well, if you're buying a thousand times, we can get them down to, to 50 cents. And if you're buying 10,000 times, we can get them down to 42 cents. So I said, well, I'll put that out, but why don't you go ahead and ship me a thousand right, right now? So, um, so that, that makes them um, more cost effective and they're totally biodegradable. There's another, um, the mat that you use for sprouting grains. They're totally organic, biodegradable cellulose mat. And I had one soaked in the solution. It looks great. I, I will be putting, we'll probably be starting. We got to wait for the mice to build up in the colonies. And then we'll be trying all these. Um, okay, so I, we really, this, this is, when this gets approved and we're dealing with EPA right now, it's very frustrating. Um, this is kind of like trying to move a mountain with a, a crowbar. Um, but when this finally gets approved and somebody brings a formulated product out to market and you're legally able to use this, it's, it's, this is gonna be a game changer for our, our industry. Um, if you do get a permit, you can go to my web uh, page, my homepage and go right down here to where it says how to use o OAE. And I'll have, a per this is for researchers um, with a permit on how to mix it up. Be sure that you rotate your treatments. Don't count on one, even though it's unlikely that mites are going to be able to evolve resistance to oxalic acid, I would never bet against evolution. So at least rotate with time all in there once a year so you hit them with a different mode of action. Okay, that leaves with a lot of uh, questions still. Um, how safe is it to the bees? Uh, exactly how does it affect the mites? What's the best dose? How long does it have residual action in the hive? Do those residues build up? Are you acidifying your hives by leaving those, those pads in there for the 70 days? And what's the differences in efficacy? Okay, of the different ways pesticides can work, oxalic may have all these different ways of working. And we're running, I'm talking too slow tonight, so I'm gonna skip through this. But there's a lot of ways oxalic acid has the potential of working against the mites. And the problem is that after using oxalic acid, for over 30 years between Europe and the United States, we're still completely blind as to what it actually does in the hive. We don't know how it works or how it distributes or anything. So I calculated off the label what the theoretical dose per bee was, okay? So by the dribble application method, theoretical dose is a little over 100 micrograms, a microgram is a millionth of a gram per bee. By spray application, 105 micrograms. By vapor application, it was 50 micrograms, but we already know it should be about three times that high. So that's about 150. So we're talking the dose per B should be about 100 micrograms theoretical. That's assuming none gets on the combs and none gets on the woodenware, okay? Keep that 100 microgram figure in your head, okay? You can be allowed to keep that one in your head. So the question is how big a dose actually shows up? on the bees and how long is the residual activity. So what we did is I figured out how to do acid-based ba titration. Of interest is it's so accurate to go down to the microgram that the amount of carbon dioxide dissolving into the water second by second means every 15 seconds you have to <laughs> re put a new drop of titrant in there if you're using the standard phenolphthalein indicator. So I switched to an indicator that only changes color at much higher um, acidity, a lower pH. So I start off with a test tube with the the uh, colorant in there, the indicator, and um, get them. We now go to the, instead of this bright blue, we now use this this color here, this this greenish blue. And you drop a bee in. If there's if it's bee has, has not been from a treated hive, there's no color change whatsoever ever. If it has any oxalic acid on its body, it turns it towards orange. So this bee has a low amount of oxalic acid. Then you take your titrant, which is calibrated, and you drop it in one drop at a time, counting your drops. And when it gets back to the original color, that's how many um, uh, micrograms there are. This shows, so uh, this one, I made up a, a 10 microgram per drop 
um, titrin. So, so um, 10 drops would be 100 micrograms, okay? Then I mixed up a solution of oxalic acid and distilled water so that 10 drops was exactly 100 micrograms. So here's your, our reference tubes. All these tubes look this color when I started. Then I put the 10 drops of oxalic acid in here. So this is the color that 100 micrograms will, will turn it. You all with me so far? Then I, so theoretically, I should take 10 drops of the titrant to turn it back. There's nine drops of titrant right there. There's 10 drops, bingo. There's 11 drops. When you hit that, so if you're not sure, you put one extra drop in, it turns to more blue. You go, oh, cool. Back off one for your count. So this is with the 10. So we now use three different solutions, titrants. One 10 micrograms per drop, one five micrograms per drop, one one microgram. Because we can now eyeball and pretty much guess what it's going to be. So you can very quickly get it down with the 10 micrograms and keep count. And we can go down to the microgram. The problem was I could titrate bees all day and go, wow, okay, okay I, you know, this treatment because I do lab trials, cage trials. And then somebody would visit three or four days later and I go, oh yeah, I got these bees over here and they, they have 60 micrograms on their bodies and I titrate it and they wouldn't have oxalic acid hardly at all. But I found that it just disappears over a few days, even at room temperature. So this last spring, I hired a new assistant. I said, Rose, and I said, Rose, she had, she had never been in a beehive. She'd never done any chemistry. But she, she showed up, made the mistake of showing me at a beekeeper meeting. <laughs> and, and I asked her volunteers volunteering. And uh, she, she um, so I, I asked her, so what's your background? Well, I'm out of the military. I was a Navy, uh, Navy ROTC. I go, okay, so you can follow orders. That's good. So, so, I, so I got her on. So we, she, um, she turned out to be the best choice I could have made. So did cra crash course in beekeeping, bee research, and and, and chemistry. We made an oxalic solution and dipped bee, uh, froze bees uh, in the freezer to kill them, dipped them in, took them out, take them out, let them uh, dry on the table, and then also vaporized some bees in a colony. And you can see the oxalic acid crystals on their hairs here. Here's a close up. So this is a bee with about 60 micrograms on, on, its, on its body compared to that 100 microgram theoretical uh, dose. And then we also put, so then we treated these bees or just plastic cover slips with solutions, okay? So on a plastic cover slip, so this is at ha immediate half an hour, one hour, two hours, eight hours, 12 hours, and then one day, two days, out to 12 days. We're tracking the acidity on those dead bees or the cover slip. This is just oxalic acid and water. Notice there's no change. It does not degrade. If you dissolve it and add either sugar or glycerin to that solution and put it on a cover slip, which would be the green and the orange line, it degrades away pretty rapidly. By one day, you're down to less than half. Okay? So there's a chemical reaction between anything organic. If you vaporize it, it's up there for a little while out on their hairs. And then when it starts getting touched into their bodies, and these are dead bees at room temperature, boom disappears. Now, normally for a chemical reaction, you could put stuff in the freezer, samples in the freezer and deal with them later. I had hundreds of samples of bees in the freezer to process, but frozen right here, the light blue line, eh, that went out and threw away hundreds of tediously taken frozen samples, realizing we got to start all over again. And we got to titrate quickly, okay, to find out and keep track hour by hour, day by day. So first I did some experiments with uh, fluorescent tracer and dribbled bees with oxalic acid and glycerin with a green fluorescent tracer. Now this is with a black plastic bag over our head out in the field and a black light flashlight. And you can see there's some glow right here in the combs where it dribbled in. But look at this one got some on its wing right there. This one got some under its, under its wings, little tiny specks on their bodies. So I built a box that we could black it out. Here's an hour after oxalic acid dissolved in water and glycerin. This bee got it drops on its wings. This one got it splattered around its body. Then these arrows all point to little tiny glowing bits. Notice the very uneven distribution in the bees, okay? It's not an even. It's a little, a little more even with vaporization, but it's much lower dose. So then I wondered what happens to, to it physically? 
because after, oh, after a day, you couldn't even see it on the bees. So what, what are they doing? So I made up a solution. I painted it on the combs right here. And within a day, it looks like that. Now, this is no chemical reaction. This is a, a, a non-reactive glowing tracer. So that means it's being physically removed. Where'd it go? Any ideas? Wait, this gentleman over here, he came up with really good common sense ideas. Dissolve, the, the tracer does not dissolve. The tracer is non-reactive. It already was dissolved. So inside the bees, a really good common sense, right? So we took samples of bees and froze them and then crushed them and then looked at their gut contents. This is the color of the gut contents under black light. This is the color of the gut contents afterwards. So out of the 150 bees that we looked at, we saw like four with a little tiny speck on their exterior, none in their guts. <laughs> so we don't know what the hell happens with it. So I get to, we have to go back with sticky boards and see if they, if they chew it off, it drops down. I don't know what happens to it. What's that? This is an inert fluorescent pigment. Non, the glow is not oxalic acid. It's the pigment showing what happened to the syrup that was on the bees. It's an inert fluorescent pigment. If it sunk in the wax, it would be glowing. It's a solid particle. There's no sinking into wax of a solid particle. And yes, you would see it. You would see it glowing easily. Obviously, it's, it's removed, <laughs> but we don't know how. Okay, so now it's got to the field. And we had, we got our, our titration technique perfected. We had a couple of colonies that had, had these pads in for 73 days under permit. Um, so I said, well, let's check it out and see how much, whether the acidity builds up in the hive. Okay, you with me? Okay. Set up a bunch of tubes, this color. And we put three bees into each tube. So we get an average for three bees. And we took bees from the hive next door and dropped them in, three in there. And notice there's no color change at all on the hive right next door, okay? So here's our reference tube, and here's the three bees in here. They all have low numbers of it. And it titrated out to about two to three micrograms per bee, as opposed to 100 micrograms. So after a 70 days there, you're down around two to three micrograms per bee. So you may be asking, well, how much is a microgram? It's a thousandth of a gram. So this is fine crystallized oxalic acid. I scraped away little tiny crystal right here. Okay, you can see the size. That's the end of a chopstick right there. That's what it does. And when you titrate it out, 65 micrograms. So that little tiny speck would be pretty, a pretty strong dose to ever, uh, in our experience, to find on a bee after any oxalic acid treatment, that little bit right there. So now we moved on. We set up 16 hives right outside my house. And we gave them each a different application method of oxalic acid and tracked them for two months. We did vaporization. We did two, two vaporizations over those two months, three different kinds of dribble and repeated them, uh, seven types of sponges and the New Zealand uh, cardboard strips um, and repeated them after a month. Uh, do not repeat the sponges, and then uh, the shop towels right here, and then different ratios of oxalic acid to glycerin, uh, use propylene glycol instead of glycerin, um, use uh, sodium bisulfate or citric acid instead of oxalic acid. So we want, to, we want to just, this is an N of one, one colony of each one. So we can't, not scientific data, but to give us an idea. March one frame in the middle of each colony to go back and sample bees from each side of it, Every, every time and took five B samples. We get an average of five. We, after, after we completed this trial, we stopped doing averages. And now we do all single, we do 10 single Bs. It's much more informative, you'll see. And here's Rose, now pretty adept at doing this. So I set her down in a chair right next to the, um, the hive so I could just hand her the samples quickly. But then it got too dang hot. So we moved her to the trailer with a, a swamp cooler and a fluorescent light above. So she could actually, I could 
with the open door here, I could just hand her the samples of bees and um, she could take them. And when I had to take a vacation, she said, well, I'll go out and take the samples. So she uh, went out and took the samples. We got a ton of data, okay? Day after day after day, um, every few hours the first day, every day, and then every few days for the 60 days. Here's the results. And so we're gonna break this down, but right now, so here's the retreatment for the um, vapor and the dribble. Here's the retreatment for the um, uh, New Zealand strips. Notice starting off, you start off fairly high and then they all, no matter how you put it on, get down in this range somewhere between uh, three to five micrograms per B and stay there pretty consistent for two months. So it does not build up in any way. Um, and surprisingly, little difference that we are now unblinded for the first time. So first we put in three, three grams per brood chamber, six grams per hive here. And then we followed up with 1.5 grams. Occasionally a bee gets hit hard, um, most of them only 20 micrograms, even immediately after vaporization, very low dose. Three different uh, dribbles at the uh, fairly hot concentration. So if you look here, the vapor, the red is the vapor at, at three grams per brood chamber. And uh, initially we were on, only averaging about 15 micrograms per B. And we did it then later at the one gram per brood chamber, or one and a half grams, it was about half the dose, half the acidity. Now, when you dribble it, you get a much higher spike right here. Not as high the second time. I don't know why it didn't get as high as spike the second time. Um, so um, now, this y-axis is the same for all the graphs you're going to see. It's 30 micrograms at the top. So some will go off the top, but I don't, I want to keep the same so you can compare them by height of the, the spikes. So seven types of sponge applications. It doesn't spike very high to start with with sponges. Spikes usually about day two to three. And that's when you get your most mite drop, I'll show you. And then they all, all the sponge applications all cracked pretty much the same over the 60 days. The two rainy events didn't seem to make much difference. Three different ratios of oxalic acid to glycerin on the chipboard strips reapplied right here. Very similar to the sponges, maybe a little bit higher uh, on, on them. And then comparing the difference between the high glycerin and low glycerin ratio. So the high glycerin ratio so are in red and the logo of the friends are in gray and that didn't seem to make much difference either. So this is all, this is all preliminary data for this year's trials for me to figure out what direction to go in. And one of the reasons why the, the flash treatments, the vaporization or the dribble does not work is you have a, a regular sized colony and a mite wash count of 25 mites if I do the calculations, you got 650 bees emerging per day from the brood for 12 days. And if it's only efficacious for two to three days, then for those rest of the nine to 10 days, you got 650 bees emerging every day. And so that's why the extended release keeps hitting them. Here's your average daily mite drop. Um, after, this is other, an other data set out of uh, Argentina. And you see it spikes on your first, uh, about day two or to three, drops down for about a month. And we also, in our own data, found it actually ele it elevates your mite wash count for about a, um, a mite drop count for about a month, and then it starts to get down below baseline. Now, that's what I was coming. What's my thumbnail doing? Okay. Okay, here, other common sense. If, the, if you're dropping a higher rate of mites every day, what would happen to your mite wash count over that time? It would go down. Okay, again, totally wrong. <laughs> it goes up for a month. Your mite wash count goes up for a month. We'll return to why later. Remember, you're getting the idea about common sense and beekeeping? Throw it out the window. You get because you can convince yourself of anything and you're going to be wrong at least half the time. In fact, in this case, wrong 100% of the time. Okay, now if I model this for standard for by days up to a month at normal mite reproductive rate, 
and you had 0% kill on a, on a daily basis, you're going to double your mite population in months. That's a given. If you kill 5% of the mites per day, and a whole just about steady. If you kill 10% of the mites every day, over a month, you're going to go down to about half, a little less than half the mites, take about two months to go down to zero. If you're doing 25% kill, it takes them all down within a month. So this is telling me that the extended release is somewhere in this range, looking like maybe a 10% kill of mites per day on average. Now, how could that work at that low microgram level? We're talking a few micrograms, you know, three, maybe three to four micrograms for a bee. So untreated bees, again, no color change. After an oxalic acid dribble, 10 individual bees off the same comb. Notice the difference in <laughs> acidity. This one here will be about 100 micrograms. This one here will maybe be like three or four micrograms right here. But huge, this is every single time we do this, huge range. This one got a drop right on its back, okay? And the other one spreads around. So the question is, how much oxalic acid on a bee's body, if we know how micrograms, does it actually take to kill a mite? So I searched the literature, and I found this great paper from 2001 from Norberto Milani. Now, Milani and Nazi were the, these two Italian researchers that are, I've never met either of them, but they, I have absolute admiration for them. They've done some incredible research over the years. He used a powder spray tower to spray oxalic acid in water, or oxalic acid in sugar solution, or oxalic acid in glycerin onto little glass dishes, weighed them, and figured out the dose on the dish per centimeter squared, how many micrograms of oxalic acid per centimeter squared. And then he picked up live mites, dropped them on there, let them walk around for an hour, took them off, put them on live pupae, and checked for mortality at 24 and 48 hours. And he came up with this dose response curve. So if they walk, this is your surface density of one microgram per centimeter squared, 10 micrograms per centimeter squared. So you have 10 micrograms per centimeter squared and the mite walks out for an hour, you're going to kill 97% of the mites by 48, 48 hours. If you're down to one microgram per centimeter squared, you're going to kill about 45% of the mites. Okay? So what do I need to make sense out of this? This is micrograms per centimeter squared. But when I apply it to bees, what do I need to know? How many centimeters squared surface area on a bee? And luckily, I found a paper where they use computerized tomography, <laughs> and they measured the surface area of a bee's body. I counted the wing surface top and bottom, so I probably overestimated. So anyway, it works out that if I titrate a bee at 32 micrograms, it'll be this dose right here. If I titrate a bee at three to four micrograms, like you get with the standard release, it'll be this dose right here. So it is plausible that if the mites move from bee to bee, and hit the average micrograms per B, that they have a, a chance, a pretty good chance of dying. Exactly. And it's, it depends on luck of the draw if it, the mite moves. And I, I don't know, I gotta move this. There's a slide coming up, Zach Lamas, the same, same one I was talking about. He, he tracked how much, individual mites in a cage move from B to B. If you put 15 bees in a cage, and he says some mites hit 15 bees in, in a week, and some mites only move for maybe one bee, but the mites do tend to move around. So it's luck of the draw for the mites. So we look at, let's look at individual bee acidities. This bee right here, after a vaporization, 1,100 micrograms. Obviously excessive dose because the bees died <laughs> very quickly. Most of them, so this is after a two gram per double deep, this is a six gram per double, double deep, okay? And, and between the two dotted lines, there's the 30 microgram level, which we expect to kill a high level, and there's the three microgram level low. So you want your dots above or between these lines. This is at half an hour, one and a half hours, two and a half, eight and a half, 12 hours, and then at one day, day and a half, two days, up to four days. So um, at, the, um, at the approved level, we don't have very many bees, and each dot is an individual bee, and there's 10 in each column, but they're overlapped, so you can't see them all. But um, not too many up, up here. At the higher level, look at all the bees that have a higher dose, up to 130 micrograms per bee. Okay, so that's, that's why we're getting um, a better uh, efficacy. With the dribble, we get, now, and these two got the same exact dribble, two colonies side by side to see if there's a difference. 
and there wasn't much. But look at all the ones that are up here. This one had 200 micrograms on, on that bee right here. But look at how many stay up here high out to, for a few days compared to the, it tends to drop off with the vaporization. They, they groom it off with the dribble that tends to stick to their bodies longer. Oh, there's the Zach's paper. I modeled this out and it looks like it should work. Now, the last thing I'm gonna talk about then, back to why would the mite count on the adult bees go up? Yeah. If they're injured, they'd probably fall off on the sticky board. Yeah. The other thing is, back when we got tracheal mite, we tried all kinds of chemicals to kill them. And I'm gonna write this up, but there's a wonderful story from the USDA lab where one day, instead of putting Vaseline on the containers, they put, they ran a Vaseline, they used Crisco. And that day they could not get the mice to infect, infest a fresh bee. And they found out the odor of the Crisco in the colony disrupted their olfactory behavior of the mite that they couldn't identify a bee of the right age to infect. So all of us started putting Crisco in our hives, okay? Didn't kill a mite, it just changed their behavior. You don't have to kill a single mite in a hive to get rid of mites. All you gotta do is let them die of old age, stop them from reproducing. So my question is, is this what the oxalic acid and glycerin is doing? Because it forms an ester. Esters are odorants for many fruit smells. I can't smell the ester, but that doesn't mean that a bee can't. So I set up a behavioral assay here where I treated from one sample of bees, divide it into two, treat it half with oxalic acid, put the two samples overnight in the incubator, let the oxalic acid and, and glycerin react, put them in the two containers here, and then got live mites off a of colony, drop 40 live mites in, see which direction they walked. Most all walked in one direction. I was very excited. So I built a new aluminum one so I couldn't have any plastic smell, got all ready to test it and went out last November to run the trials and my high mite colonies had died. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the edge of my seat all winter long, waiting to find a high mite colony to test my behavioral assay. This could be very exciting. We may have a, it may not take toxicity at all to, to control the mites. So here's what I'm pushing right now for to get our legislators in the next farm bill to give us, copy what New Zealand did, and give beekeepers an own use exemption to use generic off the shelf oxalic acid, formic acid, and time. New Zealand does this. Beekeepers aren't dying over there. Okay. There's this, and so this would solve this issue right away. So wish us luck. No, Australia. Two countries near each other. So in New Zealand, they sell these kits, the manufacturers. You can sell oxalic acid, sell glycerin, sell the strips. You just can't sell them all put together in a product. So my point to you is we're going to, the farm bill is coming up. We need to have our lobbyist, Fran, in Washington be talking there. And the only way that's going to happen is if beekeepers tell our industry leaders that they want them to do that. So this is your chance to, to do something. And the people to talk to would be either legislators or industry, our own industry leaders. All right, that is it. Yes. Most, well, when you say any examples, that means one. Yes, there's one. Okay. Most of them look the other way. Okay, um, the thing is, they've been looking the other way with the entire commercial industry uses illegal smuggled amateurs smuggled in from China or Mexico, totally illegal, and have been doing it for the last 20 years. That's the only way the commercial industry live, um, exists. So all the APA inspectors are having to turn their head because they don't want everybody's colonies to die, but they don't like that. So they, they're going to, it's even easier to turn your head when it's just oxalic acid. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, put some attendance in with her or put her in a little nuke. Okay. 
Uh, am I out of time? Where are you? Okay. We don't know. Uh, hypothesis. That's okay. This is my chance to teach people scientific terminology. <laughs>